I've got a little basket here full of wild foraged sweet chestnuts and I fancy making something really autumnal and I'm going to make a chestnut and date cake I think. Well, we were out for a walk yesterday and I kind of didn't expect to find chestnuts this year because it's been such a dry year but chestnut and oak trees seem to be having a mast year so they're producing a lot of well acorns in the case of oaks and chestnuts in the case of chestnuts and these are really nice so we just wandered around picked up as many as we could find you can sometimes just pick them up straight off the ground when they're falling out the tree like this so I've got I don't know it's about probably half a kilo of sweet chestnuts there they're quite small because they're wild they're not that clean so I'm going to give them a little wash first because they've got some soil all over them. I'm going to roast these before we use them as a flour substitute. And I nearly always have an incident where they will explode in the oven. But apparently if you cut across into the top of them like that, that's the best way. Smaller knife seems to be the way to go. So I just put it down like that and then catch that through there like that. And then the other way like that and we still get a cross in the top. I used to just prick holes in the side with a knife but I think sometimes the contents of the chestnut as it cooks kind of bubbles out and plugs the hole and ends up exploding. We'll see. This is what somebody recommended to me. I never actually tried it this way so we'll see if this works or not. This is a bit of a chore. And actually peeling them is also going to be a bit of a chore, but we're going to get through it. Now, in case you're wondering what's the difference between a sweet chestnut and a conker or a horse chestnut, I have a, I have a video where I explain what that is. And if I remember, I will link it in this card here and in the video description. If I don't remember, please somebody let me know. Okay, that's the last one. Now, it does occur to me I'm not following a recipe here I'm just making this up as I go along so I am going to weigh things and put the weights on the screen in case you want to play along in case this turns out to be an amazing success and I invent a recipe here so the raw uncooked weight of chestnuts is 556 grams so just over half a kilo of raw chestnuts I don't think that weight is going to be as relevant as the amount of chestnuts I've got after I've shelled them all anyway those are going to go in the oven now 180 degrees celsius for probably about 15 minutes Right, they're all done. I did put a tray on top just in case of explosions, but explosions there were none. Let's just test if they're done. They were singing when they came out of the oven, so yeah, I think they are. Yes, they're definitely cooked. That took about 18 minutes, and they're all cooked. They're going to have to wait now and cool down before I can peel them. But thank you to whoever that was who gave me the tip about cutting across in the top of them. That does appear to avert disaster. See, there's one there. There's one there. I think that would definitely have gone boom if I'd just pricked holes in the side. Anyway, they need to cool down, then we'll peel them. These have cooled down now sufficiently to be able to handle. And it turns out cutting across in the top of them was also beneficial in terms of peeling them too. Because you can get the knife in there at the top and just peel back the skin. So I'm just taking the outer skin off. There is in chestnuts this inner pith, which when it's raw is really quite astringent. I'm not going to worry too much about that because it's going to be mixed in with a bunch of flour and sugar and other ingredients and it's going to be cooked again anyway. So when that's raw, it's quite unpleasant, but when it's cooked, it's just part of the chestnut. And I'm cutting each one of them in half just to make sure that there's nothing nasty inside because I'm expecting that some of these will have had a little insect inside them. Not unusual to find a little maggot inside them, but very obvious when you do because it would just be a brown mass in there. I think 18 to 20 minutes was about the right amount of baking for these because they're still firm enough to handle. A little bit more than that would be nice if they were going to be eaten right away because then the inside goes a bit like mashed potato or baked potato, probably more like, and goes all fluffy and starts to crumble apart. But for this purpose, I don't really necessarily want it to do that. But yeah, they all seem to be in good condition. I'll stop if I find one that's got a bug in, just so I can show you what that looks like. Do you not normally find that they are quite so good as this? Now that cavity in the middle there is natural. That's 
just the that's just the inside of the chestnut well here's one that's genuinely iffy inside so there we go we can see actually we can see little burrows from insect larvae right there so that's going to go in the compost but only about probably half a dozen out of that big pile of chestnuts were in any way unsound the rest of them the rest of them have been remarkably good one thing that looks like it might be bad but isn't is sometimes you'll find they're a little bit kind of grayish inside that's normal that's just like the way apples and potatoes discolor a bit just not quite as fresh yellow as the other one next to it there that's all the peels and stuff will go in the compost that lot is going to go in the cake but i will just weigh that for you so we can see how much we're dealing with 384 grams of peeled chestnuts in some places i think they dry these like this and then grind them up to make flour i'm not going to be doing that today so let's get those in the food processor they're only going to probably grind down to a kind of coarse meal well yeah i think that's as fine as it's going to go and what we've got is kind of like a sticky coarse it's almost like stuffing sort of texture actually chestnut stuffing with these would be fantastic into my largest mixing bowl we got our 384 grams was it of ground up chestnuts now i'm going to add some flour to this i think you can do it with entirely chestnuts i think for that you especially probably need it ground up to a powder which i haven't got so we're going to add 100 grams of self-raising flour 100 grams of caster sugar not a lot of sugar for a cake but the chestnuts have got quite a bit of sweetness of their own two teaspoons of baking powder because obviously there is leavening agent in the flour but there isn't in the chestnuts and we need some fat in there and i think it's going to be about 150 grams probably you could use butter i'm using a vegetable baking spread here because this will be served to somebody who's got dairy sensitivity a pinch of salt if you're using salted butter you might not want to put that in there but a pinch of salt will just help to bring some of those other flavors out an amount about equivalent to two teaspoons of cinnamon and i've got mace i could have used nutmeg here but just happened to have ground mace so we're going to have it's very similar spice it's from the same plant we're going to have about the same amount of ground mace so the equivalent to about two teaspoons full that would be level teaspoons if i was using a teaspoon measure but i'm using this uh using this long spoon because it gets inside the jars and then about a teaspoon and a half of ground ginger you could grate in fresh ginger if you want to that's quite a lot of spice but this is actually quite a big cake mix because there's a lot of chestnuts in there but also i want this to have that kind of really autumnal feel to it and i've got these two apples these are wild well that's a wild feral apple that's a kind of foraged hedgerow apple from the doctor's surgery these are left over from my one day one pound budget challenge i'm just going to peel the apples well i'll peel this one i might not peel that other little one because it's so tiny there'll be nothing left by the time i peel it if you are trying to reproduce this recipe yourself these apples are probably equivalent to either bramley cooking apples or something really tart like a granny smith something bad is happening inside this apple here we'll make sure we cut around that have a look and see okay looks like this half is going to be fine just lose the core and it doesn't matter if these apples go brown because the cake is going to be quite brown anyway all right and this is the one that's got something dodgy going on which is confined to that little bit there and i'm going to cut this up as small as i can go with it really so fine dice could have done that in the food processor i suppose and also i could just keep on running the knife through it like this until there are no big pieces left i think that's probably about right do you know what i'm probably not going to bother using that tiny apple because i think by the time i've cut anything out of there it's going to be gone so that's actually about 75 grams of peeled chopped apple and that can go in as well now i said there would be dates in this didn't i so we've got some stoned dates here 150 grams seems about right and again just going to chop these up into 
pieces that are smaller than raisins. Speaking of which, if you don't like dates, you could put raisins in there instead. If you don't like dried fruit, uh, I don't know how to help you. Some recipes that you'll see for cakes talk about dissolving the dates in boiling water. I don't want to do that. I do want actually recognizable pieces of fruit inside the cake. Little pockets of sweetness. Next, eggs. I think it's going to be three. It might be four in a mix this size. I'm cracking them into a glass because once you've had an experience where you crack a bad egg into a complete cake mixture and ruin the whole thing, you kind of develop a bit of suspicion. I'll mix that up and see how it goes. If that feels a bit stiff, I might add another egg. I am at this point also going to preheat the oven to 180 degrees Celsius. That's the thrumming sound you can hear in the background. And I'm just going to beat this together with the electric beater. Yep, my suspicions were correct. I do need another egg in there, so that's four eggs. Now, if this is all seeming a bit weird and vague and made up as we go along, that's because it is. I am making this recipe up as we go, and I don't know for sure this is going to work. We are experimenting here. If this works, I will extract the recipe, and I'll put it in the video description in quantities that make sense in a list. That looks much better as a cake batter. My loaf tin I'm going to just line with one piece of paper like that because I can run a knife down this end and then just lift the cake out if it stays in one piece. And I think my mix is all going to go in here. I'm not expecting this will rise as much as a sponge cake because, you know, it's mostly chestnuts. There's only a little bit of baking leavening in there. So I'm not expecting this will puff up massively. It will rise a bit, hopefully. So just smooth that out. That might be overfilled, actually. That might <laughs> that might spill over. It hopefully will set before it does, and it will hopefully rise into a lovely loaf. Hope, hope, hope. That's going to go in the oven on a tray in case it does spill over. And we'll bake that until the internal temperature reaches something that means cooked, which I'll put on the screen right now. OK, that was pretty much an hour of baking. And I had to tent it with some foil here just to make sure that the top didn't burn. But the internal temperature is now around about 95, which means cooked. Anyway, but chiefly, the, the other test is that there's no cake batter coming out on the end of the probe. You could just do that with a skewer. And if it comes out clean, it means it's cooked. This now has to cool before I try and take it out of the tin. It's got a nice little spring to it, so it has risen a little bit. But I'm thinking this is more like a kind of loaf that you slice and have a bit of butter on than it is a cake. Gotta say, it smells amazing. Of course it would with all those spices in there, but it smells really nutty and spicy and I can smell the fruit as well. It just smells every bit as kind of autumnal and spice as I was hoping it would. All right, let's have half an hour or so to cool. Let's see what happens. Yeah, it just comes out nice. That looks good. Oh, that looks good. Still feels very lovely and moist and springy. Okay, not gonna try and cut that until it's cooled down completely. Now I've brought this up to the studio to cut it. There is a method in my madness. The lighting I've got up here in the studio is nearer to daylight, so it's dark outside now. Natural daylight is gone, and I thought we'd get a better look at what this looks like under the studio lights. Crisp on the outside. Cuts very nicely. And inside, well, it's soft. You can still see the texture of some of the pieces of chestnut. It's quite crumbly. But I suppose the test is, what does it taste like? First, I'm just going to get the thumbnail. Chestnut and date loaf. Well, as you can see, it's soft and crumbly. I will try a little piece on its own, but I have a feeling this is going to be one of those things that's best with a bit of butter on it. It's really nice. 
it's got an interesting texture that's somewhere between fruitcake and flapjack. The pieces of chestnut that have stayed as chunks are actually an interesting texture variation in there. Flavour is fantastic. Just try it with a, a smear of butter on there. I'm very happy with that. It's quite a heavy cake. That is, it feels heavy when you pick it up. But the texture of the cake inside is just so crumbly and light. I think one of the things I like best about this is the chestnuts are not lost in there. There are still conspicuous pieces and chunks of chestnut in there. And that works really well because you know that you're eating something made from chestnuts. It's not just a replacement for flour. It's a thing that works really well in its own right. So there we go, chestnut and date loaf. And that's a recipe that you've seen me kind of experimentally creating in this video, albeit based on some kind of fairly standard principles of cake making. I will extract the recipe from the video. I'll put it in the video description if you want to have a go at making this yourself or if you want to adapt it. I hope that's been interesting. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.